welcome you this Good Friday to be a part of this uh, time of remembrance. Thank you so much for watching today. <clears throat> Good Friday for Christians is a time to remember the crucifixion. Uh, and before we begin this time together, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to John chapter 19. That would be helpful as the text for my message today is in that chapter. So we come to remember uh, the cross today. Paul in his uh, letter, first letter to the Corinthians, <clears throat> shares these words. And I, when I came to you brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's bow our heads in prayer. grateful, Lord, that in this season of our lives, this season of church life, this time of crisis around the world, you've given us technology to be able to do these sorts of things in so many different ways. And so thank you, Father, that we can gather in this way. It's not the same as gathering face to face with brothers and sisters in Christ, but it's an opportunity uh, for us in unity to come together and hear your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that you might uh, bless this time, bless the reading and the hearing and the proclamation of your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity today to remember your great sacrifice on our behalf. In the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I want to uh, speak for a moment about a day of preparation. How do we find the strength to go on during the most difficult of times. Well, this might not be the most difficult of times for you, but it is for many, many of hundreds of thousands of people around the world today. We might wish that what we're going through as a world of nations be just some April Fool's joke for us all. And yet we realize today that our problems are quite real. It's hard to go to the grocery store, watch the news and get depressed. It's difficult for so many families in so many different ways. It's difficult for single people by themselves at home. These are trying times, difficult times for so many people. Not to say those that are grieving the loss of a 
loved one as so many have died. Many people find an encouragement from uh, a proverb uh, of the English theologian and historian of the 17th century, uh, Thomas Fuller, who wrote these words, it is always darkest just before the day dawneth. 200 years later, there's an Irish songwriter, Samuel Lover, who remarked that the saying of this proverb uh, became proverbial for the Irish. He says, among the Irish peasantry, to inspire hope under adverse circumstances, it was important for them to remember it is always darkest just before the day dawneth. To say today, the same words are used by therapists and self-help gurus and motivational speakers. Don't give up. Don't give up. Better times are ahead. We all have experienced dark times in our lives. We've all experienced dark times that we thought would never ever end. Yet they did. They did end. And on this day, we remember that the crucifixion of Jesus was quite a dark time. Today, and in many cases, tonight, the Christian church around the world will remember Good Friday, possibly the most misnamed day on the church calendar, at least from a common sense standpoint. After all, how could it be good when you're talking about the death of a righteous and sinless man, the death of the Son of God? Yet this story of the death and resurrection of Jesus has shaped millions and millions of lives over 2,000 years. Our calendars are set by this day. Our lives are changed by this day. Our text out of John 19 is very important uh, for us. And I'm going to read beginning with verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. This is John speaking about himself. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there in the garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, 
they laid Jesus there. Before we look at this text, it's important to remember what has led us to this. Jesus has just uttered the last words from the cross. He has confessed that it is finished. For us to understand this phrase, it is finished, we must first recognize John's insight into the crucifixion of Jesus. In John's story, in his gospel of the crucifixion, Jesus is executed at the same time, the same moment that the lambs are sacrificed in the temple. This is because for John, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the one who uh, does not represent or symbolize the Passover lamb. He is the Passover lamb. Jesus as Passover revelation represents the the, the the Jews liberation from the bondage of slavery from the uh, oppression of Egypt thousands of years earlier Jesus Christ at the same time provides a liberation for his children and from the bondage of sin and and death what clue do we have that would lead us to this particular conclusion? Well, we have the illusion of hyssop here. It's a small, flimsy plant. Now, for those of you who are botany types, um, you, you, you might recognize such a strange plant. Um, you might question what it means when you read it in John 19, verse 29. The hyssop plant would be maybe a strange choice uh, to lift. Uh, it might be better to lift a, a, a more or less heavy sponge full of wine, uh, seven, eight or more feet up in, from the ground. The hyssop plant is much too flimsy to do the job that it was supposed to do in that passage. And that was to dip it in sour wine and take it up to Jesus because he was thirsty. Way back in the book of Exodus, we read the Lord's direction of the Passover to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, where we read in Exodus chapter 12, take a bunch of hip hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood in the basin. And later that night, we know that the angel of death makes a sweep over the land of Egypt and God protects the Hebrews from the avenging angel by sparing their firstborn. So hyssop plays a role in the liberation of, of Israel from Egypt and now plays a role in the deliverance of human beings from sin and death as well. Second question may arise is, what's going on when Jesus says, it is finished? Most practical-minded people uh, would think that he, would, he meant uh, he's finished. It's over. That is, Jesus is finished. These words don't inspire the confidence of faith most of us need. Rather, they remind us of other words that we may hear, like he is history, or he is done. He's done for. The casual reader, or maybe somebody reading this for the first time, might think these things when Jesus says, it is finished. They might be hearing in their minds that he's saying, I am finished. 
the remainder of this text for Good Friday certainly confirms this particular conclusion for those who would come to this conclusion. And you really, for believers, you have to wait till Easter morning to see how the story turns out. This scripture passage talks about the day of preparation. On the day of preparation, because of uh, certain Jewish ritual taboos, arrangements were made to remove the bodies from the crosses so that they wouldn't remain there on the Sabbath. In connecting again to the Passover provisions from Exodus chapter 12, John writes regarding the Passover land, none of his bones shall be broken. That was true of the Passover lamb as well. Later in the day, the, a disciple of Jesus, uh, possibly a disciple, at least a secret disciple of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, got permission by Pilate to take Jesus' body, and Jesus and Nicodemus helped prepare the body for burial and did so as as John tells us there in verse 40 according to the burial custom of the Jews and these two faithful Jews and quite possibly disciples of Jesus laid him in a tomb that would be so vital to the announcement that would come three days later this phrase day of preparation is an important one for Christians. Just as it was for the Jewish nation in the first century. For Jews, it may have meant either the day before the Sabbath or the day before Passover. We're not really sure. Either way, it was a day in which the people prepared for a significant event in their religious lives. And so, can this day be a day of preparation for us? Why do we put a black cloth on the cross? If we, had a, if we were to have a public service today, why would we end it in silence, as so many do? Why don't we do anything tomorrow in a church? I've heard people say when we're reflecting on this that they want to avoid the suffering part of Christ's passion. People don't watch movies on the crucifixion because they want to avoid the suffering part of Christ's passion. And at the very least, can we understand Good Friday and Holy Saturday as days of preparation? Is that possible? As we all know, many Christians, especially in our modern world, want to want to skip pain and want to embrace pleasure. We we see this mindset, for example, at Christmas, where we where we the church skips Advent and goes straight to Christmas. We we skip the hymns that are sung in minor keys in Advent, like in the bleak midwinter, and go straight for the more joyous hymns of Christmas. We just want to skip the, the pain and go straight to the pleasure. Yet before you can embrace the good news of Jesus Christ, it might spiritually enrich our lives to reflect on the world's bad news today. The world that Jesus came to redeem. That world that needs redemption. It's best displayed in the pandemic that sweeps the world at this very moment. Brokenness is seen in every aspect of our lives during these times. Brokenness in how humans respond. Brokenness in the virus itself, how the world is simply broken because of the fall. 
And so in our days of preparation, we might consider Jesus' pain and suffering in order to appreciate his sacrifice. For Easter to be an occasion of joy, we must consider the agony of Jesus' death. An indescribable agony. He willingly took on as a substitute for you and for me. This is a very dark day for many reasons. But most, as we recall what Christ did on that cross for his children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for the power of your word. We pray now that as we reflect on your sacrifice, we might embrace a life of hope that only comes from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.